The individual can be overwhelmed by the problems of the world. The media, through newspapers and television, thrust at us daily the starving children in Somalia, malaria, cholera in Zaire, Haiti destroyed by a repressive regime, the tragedy of all the world in Bosnia, inner city poverty. It seems hard for us to have compassion and understanding for all the tragedies that we are constantly thrust upon us. Yet, like the book, The Power of One, individuals do make a difference. Sitting in this room are many individuals who have had a profound influence on others' lives. For me personally, the three individuals I would like to cite are Dr. John Dorst, Dr. Fred Silverman, and Dr. Donald Kirks. Each of these individuals, and many of us as individuals, fulfill the role of the power of one. If we look at global pollution, it's overwhelming. If we look at us as individuals, it's a challenge. Today, I'd like to just briefly reflect on Dr. Kirks and his power of one as he is going to be honored in presenting the seventh Silverman Lectureship. He received his BA degree at Rice University, his MD degree uh, from Washington University, and he was AOA. He interned at Parkland Memorial Hospital. He was a resident in diagnostic radiology at the University of California. He was followed that by a fellowship with Harwood Nash in uh, Toronto for sick children. He was chief of radiology at Brooke Army Medical Center in Sam Houston, and then joined the staff at Oakland. He returned to Children's Hospital in uh, Dallas, then from 1978 until 1986, he was a staff radiologist and then became the chief of section of pediatric imaging at Duke. From 1986 to 1992, he was the director of the Department of Radiology at Children's Hospital. The department that you will see and share tomorrow reflects his hours of training, his hours of planning in the organization and detail of a whole new radiology department. In 1992, he left this hospital and became chairman, Department of Radiology, radiologist in chief at Children's Hospital in Boston. But these are really descriptions. What has been his power? What, did his, what has his, been his role of the power of one? A prolific writer, he's contributed 252 articles to the literature. His textbook, Practical Pediatric <coughs> Imaging, is read by many residents. But what about him as a leader? He's published many review articles and editorials uh, on relative value layers, of scales of looking at efficacy studies and about where pediatric radiology uh, fits in the whole scope of radiology. He's been very active politically in the Society for Pediatric Radiology. He was president of the society in 1991, president of the International Society, the meeting in Stockholm. He's been president of the American University of Radiologists. There are many, many honors that he have been stowed upon him but he's deserved them. But I think that what I've learned from all of my mentors is that individually, each one of us plays a role. And whether it's teaching, reading out films, whether it's standing, presenting at a conference, or whether it's a contribution we make in our lives, culturally, we enrich those that are around us. So it's in celebration that I present and honored to present Dr. Donald Kirks as the seventh Silverman Lecturer. It's tough to follow an introduction like that, but I'll try. Well, certainly it's a professional, academic, and personal privilege for me to present this, this seventh Frederick N. Silverman lecture. Uh, as you know, this lecture was established in 1985 to honor Fred Silverman, but I think also to honor Children's Hospital Medical Center, the Department of Radiology at CHMC, and the subspecialty of pediatric radiology. 
Fred Silverman is a clinician, a scientist, a teacher, a mentor, an academic leader, and a friend. And moreover, he is one of the founding fathers of the subspecialty of pediatric radiology. He has made enormous contributions not only to the specialty of diagnostic radiology, but also to the health and welfare of children. So before giving this lecture, I would like to share some facts and thoughts about the remarkable life and career of Fred Silverman. And this is modified from the presentation to Fred of the gold medal of the AUR at its annual meeting here in Cincinnati last year. Fred Silverman was born in Syracuse, New York. And as many of you know, he celebrated his 80th birthday this past June. Fred received both his BA and MD from Syracuse University. Uh, having every intention of entering the clinical practice of pediatrics, he completed one year internships in pediatrics at Yale in 1940 and then Johns Hopkins in 1941. He subsequently accepted the L. Emmett Holt Fellowship in Pediatric Pathology at Babies Hospital in New York. And this career decision emphasized his lifelong belief that clinical knowledge is founded in basic science and pathologic correlation. World events interrupted Fred's training plans and he enlisted in the U.S. Army Medical Corps on December 8, 1941. The next three years were spent in the South Pacific. He had several tours of duty in Australia and developed a true love for this country and its people. And he has subsequently been a visiting professor in Australia on numerous occasions and has developed many lasting friendships in that country. Following his discharge from the U.S. Army in 1945, Fred returned to Baby's Hospital at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center for further training. However, he had just read the first edition of Kathy's textbook pediatric x-ray diagnosis and realized the potential contributions of diagnostic radiology to pediatric health care as well as the academic challenges of this burgeoning new discipline. Fortunately for both Fred's career and the future of pediatric radiology, Dr. John Caffey offered him a position as a special assistant, probably also another term for low paid worker bee, in the Department of Radiology at Babies Hospital with subsequent appointment as a junior associate in 1946. Dr. Caffey provided stimulus for Fred Silverman's early interest in pediatric metabolic disorders and skeletal abnormalities. John Caffey was not only Fred's mentor and advisor, but also a close personal friend. So that when the position of director of the Division of Rhinconology at Children's Hospital Medical Center here in Cincinnati became available, in 1947, Dr. Caffey convinced Fred that the career opportunities for a radiologist at this pediatric institution were limitless. During the next 30 years as chief of radiology here at Children's Hospital Medical Center, Fred trained 38 fellows in pediatric radiology. This large number of trainees who learned their subspecialty from him attests not only to Fred's great teaching abilities, but also his willingness to share knowledge and expertise with his students. Some of these trainees, uh, many who are in the audience today, who later assumed leadership roles in academic pediatric radiology include Guido Curarino, Hoosh Tabe, John Dorst, Barry Gerald, Lionel Young, Bill McSweeney, Javier Lacaya, Barry Potter, J.T. Ling, Bob Dutton, Tom Sumner, Janet Strife, and Wilbur Smith, just to mention a few. I might add that two of my mentors, two of the three people who have had the most profound effect on my career are also listed among these trainees, and that would be Guido Curino and Hoosh Tabe. As a mentor, Dr. Silverman successfully challenged, stimulated, and encouraged medical students, residents, and fellows to improve not only the clinical practice of pediatric radiology, but also to advance the science of the subspecialty. Following Kathy's description, and we'll talk a little bit in more detail about this in a moment, his description of an association between subdural hematomas and pediatric bony fractures in 1946, Silverman began collecting similar clinical and radiological material here at CHMC. His seminal article, The Rentgen Manifestations of Unrecognized Skeletal Trauma in Infants, in 1953 clearly defined inflicted trauma as the etiology of the entity now known as child abuse. His subsequent landmark article on the battered child, co-authored with Dr. C. Henry Kemp in 1962, increased physician awareness of child abuse and emphasized the critical role of diagnostic radiology for early detection and definitive diagnosis. Dr. Silverman went further than merely describing the radiological features of deliberate injuries to children. He urged his colleagues to address this increasing problem that had been ignored 
for years. As a result of his work, additional clinical studies, and widespread media coverage, all states had enacted by the mid-1960s laws that mandated the reporting of child abuse and also provided legal protection for reporting physicians. Fred moved to Stanford University Medical Center in 1976. With decreased administrative responsibilities, he was able to concentrate even more of his time on teaching and writing. And following Dr. Caffey's death, he became the senior editor of Pediatric X-ray Diagnosis and has led a group of distinguished contributors in producing the 7th, 8th, and 9th editions of this classic textbook. He also edited Essentials of Caffey's Pediatric X-ray Diagnosis in 1989. During his productive career, he's been the author or co-author of over 160 publications, which have dealt with a wide variety of pediatric radiologic topics, and many of these articles are now considered classics. Organized pediatric radiology has also greatly benefited from Fred's vision and leadership. He was a founding member and the second president of the Society for Pediatric Radiology, an organizing advisor and active participant in the European Society of Radiology, Euro European Society of Pediatric Radiology, the ESPR, and a founding member of the Caffey Society. His honors include Alpha Omega Alpha, the Silverman Society organized by his former trainees and meeting here at Children's this weekend, the Silverman Radiology Library at CHMC, honorary memberships in both the SPR and the ESPR, first gold medal of the Society for Pediatric Radiology in 1988, and gold medal of the Association of Univer University Radiologists in 1993. I count no less than 11 additional honorary memberships and recognition awards, nine international visiting professorships, and 19 named lectureships in his <coughs> curriculum vitae. These numerous awards, honorary memberships, lectureships, and visiting professorships verify the esteem in which Dr. Silverman is held by the national and international community of pediatric radiology. Fred's personal life has been blessed by the devoted marriage that he and Carolyn have shared for 49 years. Throughout his academic career, Carolyn has actively participated, as today, and supported Fred with her enthusiasm, love, and good humor. But Fred Silverman is much more than the sum of his manuscripts, textbooks, honors, awards, lectures, trainees, and visiting professorships that I have attempted to chronicle. He is first and foremost a consummate pediatric physician whose contributions to diagnostic radiology have improved the health and welfare of children throughout the world. He has served the subspecialty of pediatric radiology in the needs of sick children with skill, with knowledge, and with devotion throughout his long an illustrious career. So it is only fitting and appropriate that we honor Fred Silverman this afternoon in Cincinnati at CHMC where he spent 30 years of his unbelievably productive professional and academic career. We recognize not only a great clinical radiologist and an internationally respected academician but also a man who helped define the subspecialty of pediatric radiology. The specialty of diagnostic radiology and the care of our pediatric patients have been enriched and enhanced by Dr. Silverman's many contributions. I am grateful to the Department of Radiology at CHMC for inviting me to present this seven Silverman lecture. Again, it is a distinct honor, a distinct privilege to present this lecture, which I have entitled Pediatric Imaging, Oldest Radiological subspecialty finally comes of age. <coughs> what I'll do over the next few minutes is try to make a few observations. And this is a picture given to me by Hoosh Taby of my hero growing up in Texas as a little league catcher and then subsequently playing baseball. And Yogi said that you can see a lot just by observing. So maybe if we make some observations, uh, we'll learn something about this subspecialty. What I'd like to do is point out changes that have occurred in terms of clinical volumes, organized fellowship training, and then I've elected to pick four areas of research examples in the subspecialty of pediatric radiology. And hopefully uh, we can learn something by this sort of journey through these areas. Now what I've tried to do is list what I think are 12 important events in the history of my subspecialty of pediatric radiology. As you know, Rentgen discovered the x-ray in 1895. 
We know that there was an x-ray of a child obtained in 1896. X-ray equipment was first installed at a children's hospital. Actually on this site, the Children's Hospital in, Bo in Boston, this is the second site of Children's Hospital on Huntington Avenue. It was between uh, the Symphony Hall and the Opera House and actually shared electricity to run the x-ray equipment from the Opera House. So if they shut down their electricity, the x-ray was out of business. The first textbook of pediatric radiology, many of you may not be aware, was actually written by a pediatrician in 1910 and the first time full-time pediatric radiologist in 1926 and then Caffey's textbooks, which you mentioned, was written in 1945. And here is the author of that first textbook of pediatric radiology, Thomas Morgan Roch, or Roach, R-O-T-C-H, who was actually physician-in-chief at Children's Hospital in Boston, chairman of pediatrics, may have said something about the power and autonomy of radiology at that point in time, although the, he did acknowledge in the acknowledgments his thanks to uh, Ariel George, the radiologist, for taking such nice pictures, but the book, <laughs> The book was written by a pediatrician, and here is uh, a picture of John Caffey inscribed to Fred Silverman, uh, who wrote the, the first textbook, really, by a pediatric radiologist in 1945. Now, of historical interest, these are the third children's hospitals in Boston and Cincinnati, and they have a link, which many may not be aware of. Uh, this building was opened in 1915, af just after Roch had stepped down as chairman of pediatrics. As you know, Children's in Cincinnati was built in 1926. The construction was completed, but a chairman of pediatrics, Kenneth Blackfan, known Blackfan Diamond Syndrome, was chairman of pediatrics in Cincinnati, and he was instrumental in getting the medical school placed adjacent or to the site of Children's Hospital. And as you know, the medical school now sits where these tennis courts uh, were positioned. Blackfan. Uh, moved on to Boston Children's, became the physician in chief at that institution, and then Mitchell, who was a subsequent chairman, uh, was in place when this building was opened in 26. Now to show you how far we've come, uh, this is a picture in the early 20s. In Boston, uh, there was a convalescent home in Wellesley. It was felt to, to get sick children out into the open sunshine and air and there was actually sort of a taxi service that ran from this convalescent home in Wellesley back to the Children's Hospital. And this is from here in Cincinnati, 19, late 20s, heliotherapy, light therapy that was used for the treatment of rickets. So I think we've come a long way, not only in diagnosis, but also in treatment. The first fellowship training program, formal training program, was organized by Ed Neuhauser. The SPR was founded in 58 and the ESPR five years later. Neuhauser was the first pediatric radiologist to be an officer of a national radiological organization. A pediatric imaging research laboratory dedicated to children was open uh, in the late 70s. And we know that a wonderful research laboratory facility is, will be dedicated this week here and the first conjoint meeting of the two societies, which was one of Fred Silverman's uh, visions, occurred in 1987. I was fortunate to be involved uh, in both the first and second conjoint meetings of those two organizations. Here's John Kirkpatrick, who organized the first imaging research laboratory in Boston in the late 70s. And here's a picture from the early 70s uh, showing some of the giants of pediatric radiology. Note the collegiality of Hoosh and Fred Silverman. Jack Holt sort of separates, and then Dr. Caffey a little austere, and then Ed Neuhauser looks like he doesn't much want to have anything to do with any of this group. But I'm sure that is an artificial uh, interpretation of this photograph. Well, first, how has the practice of pediatric radiology changed? And I, I show you examples of volumes at our hospital just to give you some, uh, some idea. Again, my faculty all want to talk about ultrasound and CT and MR, but as I said this morning, still 80% of what we do are in pediatric radiology are plain films or conventional x-ray. Why have there been changes in these volumes? I think most children's hospitals have seen over the last 10 years their volumes go up dramatically. I think that's because of the increasing centralization of pediatric health care, 
the fact that subspecialization really is recognized and where as we develop practice guidelines, things like sedation and monitoring and outcomes research, I think this will become even more important and even more apparent. So the most radiology departments at children's hospitals have really become microcosms of an adult hospital. We do almost the same things in the same proportions. And a lot of this is related to this uh, increasing centralization. In terms of fellowship training programs, I only show this as at least one approach. We felt it important to have an organized fellowship training program offering either one or two years of training. And note that we divide it into first year as sort of a core curriculum training, uh, spending a lot of time in conventional, about half time, and then spending half time to imaging and allowing some elective time. The second year would be half time repeating sort of core curriculum and then spending six months of elective or perhaps selective is a better term in conjunction with departmental members and the fellow, depending on what that fellow's eventual interests are, uh, pursuing his career in his or her career in pediatric radiology. Now the third area, and I'll spend most of the time, is talking about research. And why I spend time talking about that, because today's research really is tomorrow's practice. What we do in the lab today or look at uh, is what we'll be doing tomorrow. I think that the subspecialty of pediatric radiology has really done a very poor job of pushing research or academic pursuits. Much of that's because we're a, a clinical discipline. We've had little focus, too busy doing the clinical work, uh, poor collaborations with our other pediatric colleagues around us. I must say there are very few mentors for trainees wanting to do research in pediatric radiology. And oftentimes there's been a lack of institutional or departmental support and resources for the pursuit of important research efforts. Now scientific inquiry, this is my view, at least from a radiological point of view, how can we do research? How can we answer questions? First, clinical observations, and radiology has been known for that. Uh, perhaps most of what we've done has been based on that, but clinical research, laboratory research, correlating the two, and then we'll talk a little bit more about health services research, which I think will become increasingly important. And what I've done is selected four examples from these various categories, looking at child abuse, looking at physical injury, injury to the growth plate, looking at air reduction of intussusception, and then looking at the use of CT to evaluate pediatric blunt abdominal trauma. So let's start with child abuse. I think an excellent example of clinical research, really defining a new entity uh, based primarily on diagnostic radiological findings. And here's a classic article by Caffey in 1946. If you read this article carefully, which I have done, Caffey really never states in writing that this is due to inflicted trauma, although Fred Silverman, who was a fellow with him, it says that Caffey felt strongly that, that this was inflicted trauma, but he stated that it was a, an association between subdural hematomas and fractures of the long bones. Now, as I mentioned, Fred was a fellow with Dr. Caffey, and when he came to Cincinnati, he started seeing similar cases. And here's an example. This is a child with a diastatic skull fracture crossing multiple sutures. And here is the headline from the Cincinnati Enquirer. I believe, Fred, this was 1948. You gave me this clipping. It says that the child was sitting in a chair in the front yard, and the daughter was standing beside the chair, lost her grip, and fell backwards onto a wooden toy, died later in the OR, the Children's Hospital. So Fred started seeing such cases, and this really emphasized his feeling that this was inflicted trauma. And this is a, a case from his article published in 1953, and the history here was that uh, the mother, I believe, dropped an iron on the child's arm. The child was seen in the ER with multiple burns and bruises, and Fred did a skeletal survey and showed multiple fractures of different ages, some healing, some acute, and actually took this father to a bar on Burnett Avenue, and after a couple of beers and interview, the father admitted that the child had been abused. So, this was uh, direct patient contact. And whoever, <laughs> who said that radiologists don't uh, have direct patient contact? And so after 
Caffey's original description of an association in Fred's article in 53. Then there's this famous uh, uh, meeting that was held in Chicago in 62, and Kemp Silverman was there, and they, I guess Kemp coined the term battered child, and this appeared in print, and then after this, there was a whole explosion, a recognition that this was a very common entity. So the number of publications increased, and the rest is history, and child abuse became recognized as, as an entity. And I think, really, we owe a lot of this to Fred Silverman, who uh, really described this disease entity. Now, we used to think that these bucket handle fractures, which are fairly specific for inflicted trauma or severe trauma, were due to the fact that the periosteum was tightly attached uh, at the metaphysis. We know that's not true uh, now. And that's based on the work of Paul Kleinman, who's also done a lot to increase our understanding of child abuse. And what Paul showed was that these fractures in child abuse, which again are very distinct, are actually sub-physeal transmetaphyseal fractures that extend all the way across the metaphysis. And depending on the beam angulation, we see these either as corner fractures or as bucket handle fractures. And here is histology from his work showing that if this is the physis and this is the sub metaphysis, that these infractions occur across this layer of metaphysis and extend down into this zone, the periphyseal zone, which Alan Ostreich has written a lot about and probably is important in the mechanism of why it curves away uh, from the physis at the corners. And again, depending on the beam angulation, here's the ankle, left ankle, AP, looks like a bucket handle fracture, and the lateral film, the corner fracture. So it's related to the beam angulation, but the pathophysiology is really a sub transmetaphyseal uh, fracture due to a severe twisting or jerking type injury. We've also learned something from new imaging modalities, and here's a nice example. Remember that, as described really by Silverman years ago, the diagnosis is based on, number one, inappropriate history, or what I call history out of proportion to the severity of the injury. Injuries of varying ages, and here's a nice example of MR showing on the T2-weighted image bilateral subdurals, but the T1-weighted image showing hematomas of different ages acute hemorrhage, old hemorrhage, organizing clot, so varying, varying ages, and again, in a proven case of child abuse. Specific injuries, such as the metaphyseal injury, the corner fracture or bucket handle fracture. And then finally, unusual sites of trauma, interhemispheric fissure in the brain, uh, the sternum, spinal fractures. You're talking about big time trauma. So these are the, the clues to the radiologic diagnosis of child abuse. And there's some examples, the posterior rib fracture, multiple healing rib fractures posteriorly, or as in the case I showed from 1948, if we see, again, from work done at this hospital, fractures that cross sutures, fractures that are diastatic, think of inflicted trauma. And then finally, cross-sectional imaging, the dense cerebellum sign, the term preferred by Harwood Nash, or the reversal sign is coined by the group here in Cincinnati, reflecting profound edema, uh, secondary to hypoxia, interhemispheric uh, acute hemorrhage, hemorrhage under the tentorium. The role of nuclear medicine, here's a child with an obvious fracture of the left tibia, but the bone scan shows that indeed there are also multiple posterior rib injuries to document varying injuries and therefore highly suggestive, if not diagnosis, diagnostic for the diagnosis of child abuse. So that's clinical research. Now what about basic laboratory research? And I've selected some work done primarily by Diego Jaramillo in my department looking at the physeal injuries. Now we're all familiar with the classification by Salter and Harris, two, orthope two orthopedic surgeons, Hospital for Sick Children in 1960, who described various types of fractures, depending on whether the fracture involves the plate only, the plate and metaphysis, the plate and epiphysis, all three, or finally the crush injury, or type five Salter-Harris uh, classification fracture. 
Now, going back to our days of histology in medical school, remember that the normal physis, if this is the epiphysis and this is the metaphysis, four layers, the zone of resting, the zone of proliferating cartilage where the cells start to line up in rows, the zone of hypertrophying or vacuolating cartilage, and then finally the zone of provisional calcification where osteoid is laid down. And this is from article in 1970. If you induce experimental fractures in the physis, the common teaching in those days was that the fracture always ex occurred through this third layer, through the zone of hypertrophying cartilage. Not that it's so important, the specific layer, but to remember that the physis is weaker than the adjacent muscles and or tendons. So that adults which, injuries which in the adult may produce a sprain or strain in the child may produce an epiphyseal plate fracture. And again, other workers, including Harmio, have shown that in fact, these fractures oftentimes extend through various layers of the physis, and those that are more prone to develop bony bridging are probably due to injury to the zone of resting and or proliferating cartilage, the germinal layers of the physis. So this may be important in terms of predicting injuries which will have a bad outcome. And here are two examples. This is a child uh, who had had a fracture of the knee a couple of years previous, came in with bowing at the knee and shortening of the right lower extremity. Here's the plain film and here's a tomogram showing, in fact, an old Salter Harris type 4 epiphyseal plate fracture with injury to the growth plate medially, continued growth laterally and medially, so-called ball and cup deformity described by Caffey. And what has happened is there has been injury to the physis in this location, <coughs> preventing growth and leading to bowing and limb shortening. Another example, a child who presents with leg length discrepancy. Here is with a Bell Thompson ruler in place. You see that the shortening involves primarily the right tibia. And if we do a tomogram of the distal right tibia, we see an old fracture, probably a Salter Harris type four with fusion of the growth plate medially. Well, what's the mechanism of these bony bridges? What, what causes uh, the closure of the growth plate in these areas? And what is the role of MR in clarifying that? And what is the role of MR in looking at physical injuries at all? And here's an example. Here's a plain film of the left ankle, which looks like a Salter Harris type two epiphyseal plate fracture. However, the MR, if we look at the normal physis of the distal fibula, look at the difference in the normal physis, the tibia, there has been marked injury, edema, involving the physis of the tibia. And in fact, this is probably a Salter Harris type four injury, and this patient is at great risk for eventual limb shortening due to fusion of the physis. Well, Jaramillo asked this question, what produced these physial bony bridges or bar, and he went to the laboratory using MR to image experimentally induced injuries to the physis, and what did he show? And here is one such experimental animal in which he has injured the physis, and this is a lateral MR image, and we can see the bone marrow is extending from the metaphysis across the growth plate into the epiphysis, so this is a bony bridge formation. And here is the histologic correlate, here's the normal physis, and here is this bony bridge extending across the physis, interrupting normal growth at the physis and potentially leading to either limb shortening and or angulation at the fracture site. And so he nicely showed the mechanism. What one does is a physial injury that can be infection or trauma, a fracture. You injure this. This allows the ingrowth of vessels across the physis with subsequent deposition of osteoid as the cartilage cells die, secondary to the vascularity, and with subsequent ossification producing a bony bridge. And we're familiar with the conventional plain film findings, physial fusion, shortening, distorted growth lines, which I've shown you, and also increasing evidence that cross-sectional imaging may be helpful in predicting injuries which are prone to develop such complications and or documenting the extent of such bony bridging. The third area, and that is asking a clinical question, doing clinical research, 
more questions raised, going to the laboratory to answer those questions, and then using that knowledge to, I think, improve clinical care. And that is error reduction of interception. and most of this work is done by one of my former fellows, and a fellow here in Cincinnati, Bill Shields. We know that as complications of error reduction or any reduction in susception, two potential complications, recurrence and or perforation. And Ole Ekloff, the largest series, over 1,300 cases, said that this perforation rate is fairly uniform. If you do enough in susception reductions, unfortunately, eventually you'll have a perforation. He says it's less a favor of the method than an unfortunate uh, complication of the technique. And I'll make a few comments about that in just a moment. So in 1987, the Caffey Award paper presented in Toronto at that first con conjoint meeting was from Toronto by a group of radiologists, including Dr. Lila Gu, who had come from China. And she asked the radiologists there in Toronto, why don't you ever use air for in a susceptible reduction? We've used it for 25 or 30 years in China. And so in response, they started doing a study. This was presented, and then we came back to Cincinnati and thought, well, we will try, start trying to do this at least clinically. And Bill Shields designed this device for safely insufflating air for in the susception reduction. And here's Gary Hedlund, who's in the audience, showing the advantage of this device. It can be handheld, and you can do fluoro and monitor pressure simultaneously. Some of the other devices that were designed were very large and bulky and hard to use, but this was small and compact and handheld, and one could accurately measure the pressure of insufflation. And here's a typical example of a child who presents with abdominal pain. Soft tissue mass in the right upper quadrant. We insufflate air about 60 millimeters of mercury. We can see the intussusceptum. Increase the pressure, reduces to the ascending colon. Continue the pressure, 100 millimeters of mercury. Soft tissue mass holds up at the ileocecal valve and then increase the pressure to 110 millimeters of mercury. Free flow of air into the terminal small bowel and disappearance of the soft tissue mass from the cecum. So successful air reduction. Now, Bill Shields and George Bissett and I submitted this as a technical note to a journal which will remain anonymous. And the journal wrote back and said, the journal cannot sanctify your technique. We didn't want to sanctify it. We just wanted to publish the paper, right? <laughs> so I told uh, Bill Shields, I said, well, Bill, let's, con let's continue our unholy clinical trials, and maybe we'll get this published somewhere. And sure enough, a year later, Walter Burden was kind enough or agreed to publish this as a technical note in pediatric radiology. And I think there has been increasing interest and in use of air uh, for reduction of intussusception. And then Shields did a clinical study in which he compared 100 cases using air to the previous 100 using barium or water soluble. And what he found was that certainly this technique was quicker, about a half to a third of the time required for positive contrast, water soluble or barium, therefore much less reduction or much less radiation time. And also in our experience, a higher success rate. But other questions were asked. What about perforation? Does this increase the likelihood of perforation? What if the bowel perforates during air reduction of intussusception? What happens? And so Shields asked these questions and went back to the laboratory and developed a model uh, in the piglet in which he looked at perforations. And here are two typical perforations induced by air, showing that with air perforations, the peritoneal cavity remains pristine and clean. And I'm not showing you a barium, but I can tell you that barium takes a slurry of stool into the peritoneal cavity and contaminates uh, the peritoneal cavity. Moreover, the perforations induced by air are about one half the size of those induced by water soluble and or barium, probably related to the fact that air is compressible and can insinuate itself to the bowel wall, whereas liquid cannot. And then subsequently, Shields won the Caffey Award in 1991 at the IPR meeting, again, presenting this experimental data, data verifying that at least in the experimental animal, we felt air was safer, uh, less risk for peritoneal contamination. The other point which has been made in several publications is many of these perforations may not be induced by the reduction itself, but may simply be uncovered 
perforations. Perforations that are already there, but as you reduce the intersusception, you uncover them and contrast, whether it's air or barium or water soluble, goes into the peritoneal cavity. My answer is that no matter what the mechanism is, if perforation occurs, and remember Ekloff says that it occurs in 1 in 250 to 1 in 300, I personally would rather be using air than either barium or water soluble contrast. Then the final area is health services research. Now that's a big term. What is health services research? Well, it's a glorified way of saying that this is a defined area of research, which is now, particularly in this era of healthcare system reform, is looking at the impact of organizations, financing, and management in terms of, in trying to assess the delivery of health care, the quality of that care, the cost effectiveness, the access, and then eventually outcomes research. And therefore, I think in radiology, we're critically positioned to answer a couple of important questions. Certainly, technology assessment we can answer. But we can also do a better job in terms of patient outcomes, developing practice standards and guidelines, making decision analysis, and trying to come up with the most cost-effective way of delivering pediatric radiological health care. And I think CT of blunt trauma is one nice example. Now people say, what's the best way to, to image splenic injury? And here's a liver spleen scan showing a nice splenic fracture. It's certainly cheaper. It's as quick. The problem is children with blunt trauma don't come in labeled, I have a splenic injury. In fact, most large series show that about 20% will have multi-organ injury if they have injury at all. So that's why CT has become increasingly important. And here's an example, CT without contrast, CT with bolus enhancement, we see a huge fracture of the spleen with perisplenic hematoma. In the early 80s, Berger and Kuhn first published a paper pointing out the value of CT and blunt abdominal trauma in children. They pointed out that it was quick, even in that time, over a decade ago, that you could image multiple organs. Again, 20% of positive studies will have multi-organ injury. And you could assess certainly anatomy, even certain structures such as the kidney blood flow, and assess the amount of peritoneal fluid and or the presence of peritoneal air, which is obviously a surgical indication. And here's an example. This is a child who presented with hemat gross hematuria, concerned about renal injury. Sure enough, there's a complete fracture of the left kidney with a perirenal hematoma, but there's also a splenic hematoma as well as a hepatic hematoma or laceration. So showing the value of CT, multiple organs. Here's a child who fell 12 feet off of a rooftop, has gross hematuria, the abdominal CT shows a small laceration of the posterior segment of the right lobe of the liver, but no complete absence of perfusion of the left kidney. I think you can almost see the left renal artery coming out to abrupt termination. The injury was only about two hours previous. Therefore, we went to angiography, and sure enough, complete obstruction of the left renal artery, renal pedicle injury with secondary thrombosis. So again, in this case, CT showing multiple organs, but also assessing blood flow and perfusion of this particular organ. And so in an important study from this institution, pointing out the value and the role of CT in the evaluation of upper abdominal trauma in children, and then a series of articles from the other large institution, DC Children's, started looking at blunt trauma and the role of CT. And here's a descriptive term of, a descriptive article describing hepatic and splenic injuries, and trying to first determine the role of CT in the detection or the decision uh, for laparotomy. And so that based on these initial studies, it became obvious that as in the adult, there are three groups of patients. Those with trivial trauma that are stable require only observation. Those who have had severe trauma that are unstable need to go immediately to the OR. And the third group that CT, I think, has become critical, and that is known severe trauma but yet are clinically stable in those patients, CT plays a critical role. And again, Taylor, based on his work from DC Children's, pointed out some indications for computed tomography in children with blunt abdominal trauma. The problem is most large series, 
the positive rate for abdominal CT is only about 18 to 20 percent. We're doing an awful lot of patients. Uh, so what are the real true indications? And in response to those questions and looking at outcomes, uh, before I get to that, another important uh, entity was described by Taylor, and that is the so-called hypovolemic shock syndrome. And this is an unfortunate case of child abuse, a very severe injury. You can see that there's no perfusion of the spleen, very dense aorta, small aorta and cava, a complete fracture of the pancreas, lots of peritoneal fluid, lower sections show small aorta and small IVC, and Taylor showed that in this group of patients, demonstrating these CT findings, the prognosis is dismal. About 85% of these patients will expire within 48 hours of the study. So in a sense, the worst type of outcomes research possible, showing that this is a severe, severe injury, a very, very poor uh, prognostic indicator. And then Taylor has actually tried to develop an ab abdominal injury score Again, trying to get at the studies which are going to be positive, trying to avoid 80 percent uh, negative studies. And what he's come up with are what he calls high-risk indicators and low-risk indicators. And I show you that two of the low-risk indicators, similar work was done here in Cincinnati showing that the yield is very low in microscopic hematuria and also in a low Glasgow com coma score if there are no other abdominal findings. And with this score, what Taylor has done is developed an odds ratio. For example, if you have a patient with a documented lap belt injury, the chances of that study being positive are very, very high. And what they did was then correlate the predicted probability from this score versus the actual observed frequency, that is positive CT scans. And what you can see is that there is a very good correlation. So there is increasing evidence that by looking at predictors, we can get a better handle on which study, patient should actually be studied by CT and therefore hopefully limit that to those who really need it. And so this is an example of the abdominal imaging scoring system or abdominal injury scoring system. For example, if you have a child with a lap belt injury, 24, let's say has abdominal tendon is 12, that's what, 36, as well as abdominal dist distension, 43. And here's a nomogram. If you go to 43, then you know that there's about a 35% predictor that this study will be positive. So a better way of trying to separate out which patients will benefit from subsequent abdominal CT uh, following blunt abdominal injury. So in summary, what I've tried to do is point out that if we look back over a hundred years, I think pediatric imaging, which really was the first subspecialty of radiology at a children's hospital, as I said, shortly after the discovery of x-ray and even before uh, Rinkin received the Nobel Prize in 1901, there was x-ray equipment at a children's hospital. Our organization was founded in 58. I think we finally come of age. We now are a microcosm of an adult department. Uh, I think most places offer organized and valuable fellowship training for the pediatric radiologist of the future. And I've tried to select four areas uh, which I think point out how research can be done in pediatric radiology, whether it's clinical research, whether it's laboratory research, whether it's asking cl clinical questions and taking them to the laboratory and then correlating it with subsequent clinical studies, or finally, if we can actually get into this new area of research, health services research, technology assessment, and outcomes research. So again, I would like to thank the department, Dr. Strife, for inviting me to present this lecture in honor of Dr. Silverman, and I thank the audience for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Lucan will come down and the lights up. Um, we would like to thank you for that fine talk. And uh, as part of uh, the University of Ra Radiology Department at the University of Cincinnati, this is a plaque that is given to you.
It reads, the seventh annual Frederick N. Silverman Lecture delivered September 9, 1994. This plaque is presented with appreciation and esteemed recognition by the Department of Radiology Children's Hospital Medical Center. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.